Uh, hello everybody, thank you for joining. I can see well over 100 of you now, so we're gonna get started. This one is going to be fun and slightly different, I think. I guarantee you that 99.9% .9 of you have never been to this place that we're going to explore in our mind's eye today. And I think it's gonna be um, quite a delight. So I hope you're doing okay. I hope you're feeling well in here and well in here, wherever you may be. So why don't we just get started and jump right into it. So today we are headed outside of Paris. I see Pau S says, my hair is looking good in the comments. Thank you very much. Uh, before we get started, by the way, I want to mention something that if you, if you want to share this, that would be great with someone who you think might need the distraction today, uh, or you can share the replay afterward. If you have a good connection, internet connection where you are, uh, try setting um, the, the, the video settings in YouTube to 1080p, the max quality settings, because that will give you the best um, the best image. And uh, what else do I want to say? Uh, that's about it. We're going to use two, two different occasions of where I took photos of this place. It's called the Chateau de Breteuil, and it's just outside Paris, and uh, it's got some surprises up its sleeve. Um, lastly, there are lots of ways to support me here. You can sign up for Patreon. There's a link in the description. You can use Super Chats during this. If you want to send me a tip in real time, there's a little dollar sign next to your chat box. Um, that's always appreciated. And then, of course, you can share it around and whatnot. And when you finally do make it to Paris, because you will make it here uh, eventually, uh, you can take tours with me, and I'm a full-time tour guide. So you'll find that link as well if you want to book something for later in the year or next year. So let's get started. I've already got uh, a super chat, a $2 donation by Christina Console, and she is reminding me that the book club for our private Patreon community, there is a uh, meeting today. Later today at, let me check the time, uh, after Corey's chat at 12 p.m. 12 p.m. Eastern Time in the States. So thank you, Christina, for that reminder, and you can join her for that. Sorry, I'm shaking the table. Let's get started here. So what's happening today is we are, hold on, let me fix the volume here. We are just outside of Paris, about a 45-minute uh, ride, car ride, from the center of town. You can see it down there in the lower left. It's called the Chateau de Breteuil. It's in a beautiful green area to the southwest of the city. And it's a stunning property with um, almost 200 acres of land. And I'm going to start showing you some photos here. The Chateau de Breteuil um, completed in 1610, this beauty, which makes it a product of the same era as the Place des Vosges in Paris and the Place Dauphine. You can see some of that beautiful brick architectural influence that the Place des Vosges is known for. So that certainly must have been a trend and a fad back then. And there are so many of these illustrious palaces and chateaux and residences all within an hour or less of Paris. And this one, the Chateau de Breteuil, that we're going to focus on today, was special in that it was uh, the, the home of a long line of nobles, including men who served as ministers to King Louis XV and Louis XVI. And as you can see, it's already a stunning property, and we're, of course, going to really zoom into the details here. And we're also going to get into the history, as you know, uh, I am want to do. One of the most famous uh, men of this uh, chateau was a gentleman called Baron Louis-Auguste de Breteuil. And you can see him here as a strapping young gent. He was, the, the Baron de Breteuil, very close to Louis XVI, leading up to the French Revolution, um, such a close member of the king's court that Marie Antoinette was a friend and an admirer of the Baron de, de Breteuil here, and so much so that Marie Antoinette gave this gentleman many gifts, several personal gifts which can still be seen in the chateau when you visit it, and I'll take us in there in a moment via my photos. In fact, he was so closely tied to Louis's court that on the 14th of July, when the Bastille was stormed and they kicked off the French Revolution in 1789, this guy, this baron, was the prime minister of France. So he was an unfortunate timing for this gentleman, but a staunch supporter of the royal family. He would even, during the revolution, would later help to orchestrate the escape of the royal family uh, when they uh, famously fled Paris to the town of Varennes, almost successfully turning the tides for them and saving themselves. But then they got caught and dragged back to the city and it was off to the guillotine for them. But this Baron de Breteuil, the one of the former um, uh, residents of this chateau, was very, very closely tied with Marie Antoinette and that royal family even helped them try to escape. The revolutionaries would have been very happy to 
behead this gentleman because of his ties, but he managed to escape the guillotine by fleeing France and exiling himself in time, and then he would return to the country later when Napoleon Bonaparte was um, reigning the land. Another amazing character, if we go back a little further in time, a previous generation, was a woman this time, and her name was Émilie de Breteuil, and she's also referred to sometimes as the Marquise du Châtelet. And she was a learned woman back in the, the, the 18th century, learned in um, mathematics and, and science and philosophy, and she spoke several languages, and she was a talented musician and sang the opera. She even translated Newton's laws of physics into French, which is a translation that we still use today. Uh, the French still use it as the part of the official translation of Newton's theories of physics. And all the men around Émilie uh, fell in love with her and they were fascinated by her. But her most famous companion by far was Voltaire, the famous philosopher. Uh, Voltaire was typically uh, a rather reserved and unaffectionate character, and, uh, but he fell head over heels in love with Émilie de Breteuil, the Marquise du Châtelet. And the two of them spent lots of time together. And um, he was such an admirer, admirer of, of hers, rather, that when um, Voltaire created his own book of Newton's theories, he included this engraving that I'm going to pull up, which is really quite spectacular. And it shows Voltaire at his desk, and Émilie herself, Émilie de Breteuil, is up there floating with a mirror, and she's acting as the muse or the, the conduit through whom um, Newton is passing down his ideas to Voltaire. So we've got Newton in the upper left and the light of Newton's knowledge, as you can see, in a very literal sense, bouncing off the mirror held by Émilie and then bouncing down toward Voltaire. So Voltaire, Voltaire and Émilie had a quite a long uh, relationship together. They were intellectual friends and also lovers. And in fact, if you've ever walked through Paris, chances are you have walked through one of the homes that they shared because Émilie de Breteuil had a home on the eastern end of Ile Saint-Louis. I don't know, hopefully some of you recognize this, right at the very tip of the eastern part of the island, and this is called the Hôtel Lambert. And that's, this is where she and Voltaire spent a lot of time together. And so, interesting tie back to Paris. It always ties back to Paris in one way or another. Let me just check the, uh, the comments here and see what everybody's up to. Thank you so much. I see um, Leslie T sent me a, a super chat saying thank you so much for these virtual visits. I really hope it's helping you. Um, to stay a little bit distracted and inspired and a reminder to all of us that there's still a lot of beauty um, and charm out there in the world. So back to the chateau itself. Uh, I'm going to take us inside the interiors here. There's a lot to see, the interiors and also the, the gardens. We're going to have fun exploring those. And on the inside here, um, there are many original objects from the era of the French monarchies. You've got portraits of kings and ambassadors and officers all around. There are tapestries hanging on the walls from the famous Gobelin factory in uh, Paris. This residence has been in the same, uh, the same uh, family for three centuries. The current owner actually lives here. He inherited the place in 1967 when he was 23 years old. 23 years old, he inherited this chateau. Um, and he had no money at the time, and it was quite run down, the residence. And so he decided over the course of several years as a younger man to um, restore it and build up the, 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 the chateau and make it um, a family-friendly attraction to visitors. And so what he decided to do was, and we're going to see here an image come up of the little dining room of the crêperie, he decided to install throughout his property these life-size installations of fairy tales with complete, you know, with wax figures and music, and you can visit them from one to the next. And there are, you know, there's like a PA system that will, that will tell you the story. And so when I, when I chose the title of this, it was Flowery Trails and Fairy Tales. That fairy tales part was not frivolous. That was not just for fun. I put that in the title because this is literally France's fairy tale chateau. And the reason is um, the gentleman who created fairy tales in general, he was a, a Parisian writer in the 17th century. His name was uh, Charles Perrault. And all the French people know this word, uh, this, this name rather, Perrault, because he invented some of these iconic fairy tales that we still know today. And the chateau has many of them um, on display. And that's why this chateau is fantastic for kids. So this Perrault guy was a member of the royal court in the 17th century, and he wrote Sleeping, Sleeping Beauty, which we can see here. He also wrote um, Cinderella which we can see here, which is also on, on view. He wrote Little Red Riding Hood and Puss in Boots, and he, he was the inventor of all of these iconic 
uh, fairy tales. And so this is great. As you can imagine, we take our girls through here and they absolutely adore this chateau because it's got traditional history and architecture and gardens, but also a lot going on for the kids. And this Perrault gentleman, when he wrote these, as you can see Puss in Boots here, um, he can see these, uh, he, he, he basically rocked everyone's world in the, in the high, members of high society in the royal court. They were absolutely um, enamored by his fairy tales. And then, of course, they spread throughout the world. So these are all over the property. And you can see we've got Mother Goose there. So that's one aspect. It is the fairy tale um, chateau of France, I like to call it. And again, this is less than an hour outside of the city. And uh, if you descend into the kitchen, so I've got some beautiful images of the kitchen. It's one of my favorite um, parts of any chateau visit. At first, it's pretty standard. It's got all the lovely accoutrements and uh, tools and, and utensils and whatnot. But then it's also got some a bit of um, whimsy as well, because in 1905, King Edward of England, King Edward VII, came to visit the folks of this chateau. And uh, he was good friends with the owners. And this represents, they set up the wax figures to represent the preparation in the kitchens of the servants, um, creating the meal and the luncheon for King Edward VII. So this would have been, we've got a bit of a Downton, Downton Abbey-esque vibe here. This is the dining room where the servants would have dined. Barbara Marr says, what a kitchen. And so again, this is fun for families as well. Keeps the kids interested. This is the chef and the chauffeur in, this, in the next room preparing some food. And in this next image, you can see the lady of the house here who's coming to congratulate the chef and also make sure everything's in order. She happened to be, at this time in 1905, the lady of the house was American. Speaking of Downton Abbey, if we have fans out there, she was an American um, here in France and she is, was the grandfather of the current owner today who still will give you tours himself, the owner of the chateau. Um, sometimes he's the one who leads the tours through his own home. And uh, I'll pull up some, some more images of the kitchens just for fun. We've got the pantry with the, the food being prepped and whatnot. I can see Leslie T says, wow, the kitchen is so cool. Diana Ranke thinks it's great. Thanks everybody for these I think this is funny, this pastry chef who looks quite stressed. Um, anyway, we're going to go back out to the details of the chateau and just take a walk around outside a little bit. Hi, Lucien. I can see you there saying good morning. Angie's asking if there's a wine cellar. Uh, maybe, but it's not accessible during the visit. There are more rooms inside that... Um, I didn't photograph because I was outside with, the, with my girls when I was here. Uh, a lot of these photos were taken from last fall, and you'll see that particularly when we get to the um, garden photos. June Parham says, gorgeous roof lines. Thanks, June. Here you can see there's a, essentially a moat around all four sides of the... Um, residents, and that was pretty common. Sometimes uh, they were filled with water, but most often it was just a dry moat, to, obviously for security reasons. Nowadays, we can't see it, I don't happen to have the photo, but there are uh, goats that just roam around freely and they keep the grass trimmed down there, and so you can usually ca catch a glimpse of the goats galloping around and, and doing their thing. So they've got a pretty nice life there. What we can see in this photo, though, is our next location, because just off to the side of the Chateau de Breteuil, you see what they call in French a colombier. Colombier, or in English, sometimes it's called the dovecote because it was a house for doves and then sometimes pigeons as well. And we're going to zoom in a little bit there because you can enter it, and there's also uh, some other fun, fantastical types of um, objects inside. So you'll see that smaller window there up towards the top, sort of halfway up, was literally for the doves and the pigeons to, to fly through. And this is the only leftover of the previous medieval fortress on this property because this residence that we're looking at today is from the 17th century, but if you went back a few hundred years further in time, um, usually these class more classical residences replaced a, a fortified palace of sorts, a fortress. And so this is the only leftover uh, from that. But when you walk inside, you're gonna see immediately, I've got an image of the, the roof here, and you can see all the niches where the pigeons were meant to uh, roost and live. 
In medieval times, uh, these were strictly, strictly regulated, these types of buildings, these uh, colombiers or pigeonniers, and only um, certain classes of society were even allowed to have them. But pigeons were used for three things uh, back in the day, going back a long, long time. In the 13th century, um, they were used for food all the time. In, fr in fact, the French royal court in medieval times ate 400 pigeons a day in the royal court of uh, Saint Louis. They were also used for fertilizer, you know, the droppings, and uh, that was very effective, the, the, the bird droppings for farming, and then also messages. You've probably heard that pigeons were, they'd have messages tied to their foot, even going back to the Greco-Roman days. So those are the three uses of pigeons, and that's why these were very popular for wealthy families. But then what we've got here is, as you walk around, they've got these small little models, and these models have been set up to represent famous paintings, paintings in particular of um, dinners. Uh, luncheons and uh, dinners and uh, just uh, table events. So here, I don't know if any of you recognize it, but it's meant to be Renoir's Luncheon of the Boating Party. And I'm going to pull up an image of the actual painting here, which is a fan favorite. And then I'll bring it back to the model so you can see. So that's kind of fun. And again, another family-friendly aspect. And then I'm going to pull up some others here um, with some side-by-side -side images. You can see here, this is yet another one. This one on the left, you can see the actual model and on the right, the painting itself. This is called the Oyster Dinner and it's by a lovely painter called uh, Jean-Francois de, de Troyes or de Troyes, um, D-E space and then the, the name Troy. So really fun, you know, it's not 100% accurate, but I see what they were doing here. And I'll bring up some other ones as well. This is all inside of the, the pigeon house, the Colombier. This next one's called a Luncheon of the Hunt by the same artist, de Troyes. And then here, this is a, um, it's called Nobleman and Lady Drinking Chocolate, Drinking a Hot Chocolate, based on an engraving by Nicolas Bonnard. So as you can see, there's a lot going on in the chateau. Um, we're going to walk a little bit further, sort of outside of the gardens here, continue our virtual stroll in our mind's eye. I love a good manicured bush. So like I said, almost 200 acres of the Chateau de Bretagne, and, and um, I've still got a, a, a nice montage to show you of the garden, some images. We're out at the stables here, and you can enter the stables because there are more installations of the fairy tales. Some of them are located here. And you see there's a, there's a beautiful trough here. Um, shout out to superfan Heather Liebhart, who is a, a big horse enthusiast and a riding enthusiast. She's a big fan. So I thought of you, Heather, when I was preparing the stable photos. So that's a little bit of the chateau. That's the Colombier, that's the kitchen, that's some of the fairy tale installations. And what I want to do next is change gears a little bit. Uh, I want to show you some of the, the beautiful English style gardens. I took a lot of photos over two different visits last year, uh, primarily last fall when the colors were really beautiful and there was some great flowers. I did, after all, call this flowery trails and fairy tales, so we're going to get to the flowery part uh, next. And what I want to do is you're going to see this terraces and trellises and a labyrinth and the flowers and cute little cottages and whatnot. And so I'm actually going to shut up now. I'm going to pop on a montage that I put together for you um, of photos that I took. It's about three minutes long and we're just going to partake in a little bit of um, meditation as it were. And the soundtrack I chose for this is a tune that, speaking of Downton Abbey, reminded me very much of the Downton Abbey soundtrack. And if there are any fellow fans of that show, uh, I think you'll see what, what I mean by this. So sit back, relax, maybe turn up the music a little bit. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to play this for you now and turn off my mic. And here we go.
Okay, so hope you all enjoyed that. And I got caught up a little bit in it myself and I was just watching the comments go through and I forgot that I was supposed to come back and talk to you. So uh, I hope, you, hope that was transporting for you all and um, I enjoyed making it for you. And uh, it's a lovely place, the Chateau de Bretagne. If you want to get there yourself, it is doable via public transportation. And I put the, the instructions or the directions down in the description of this video. So just scroll down in the description and you'll find I laid it out exactly what you've got to do. It's just the RER train and um, a quick little 15 minute bus ride. So thanks everybody for the lovely um, comments that I can see here. Diana Ranke sent me a super chat during it and some of you uh, did as well. So I hope you enjoyed that and hope it brought a little bit of loveliness to your day. So that's about it. I think we're going to wrap up this episode number 79, home edition of my Paris live series. If you are a patron, then you know where we're headed. We're having another champagne chat from my backyard privately on Facebook in our Cafe Chats group. And I'm going to drink some, some pink champagne this time and bring on a guest, a special guest called Lisa Chorney, who's one of my great longtime followers. And she's going to talk to us about meditation. She's an enthusiast and she knows all about it. She's been practicing it for years. And I think now's a great time to talk about that. If you want to become a patron and get rewards and support me in the process, because um, it's a good time to support tour guides, uh, honestly, without the travel uh, anywhere in the world, I have people traveling. So you can do that in the description as well and, and all that good stuff. I think that's about all I want to say. I wish you all um, a healthy and safe and beautiful day, inspired. Um, take care of yourselves, take care of each other. You know where to find me if you need me. And we're going to switch over to... In about 10 minutes, look at your patrons, look at your watch. In 10 minutes, we're going to do the champagne chat in our private group, okay? Thanks, everybody, for joining me. If you can't bring yourself to Paris, I'm going to bring it to you. In this case, almost Paris, not quite, but close enough. Hope you enjoyed it and have a lovely day. Take care. I'll see you next week for another one. Bye.